But thanks for joining. We're going to hear um, some great stories from our customers today about how they're using uh, Amazon S3 to build big data platforms. And S3 is uh, such a fundamental part of our big data ecosystem that um, it's great to hear these real stories. And we're going to hear from uh, Redfin and Twitter about what they're doing. And just to set the, the scene, you know, S3 is an object storage platform. It's designed for very high durability, 11 nines of durability. And what that really means is that out of 10,000 files, if you store them on S3, you could theoretically lose one of those files in 10 million years. So when we talk about durability, this is a system that's really designed to hold all of your data, to scale automatically, and to give you extreme confidence that your data will be available. And it's integrated with our big data services at a very low level. It's also designed for uh, allowing you to manage the cost very effectively. So around three cents a gig for standard redundancy in S3. And then we've recently launched a, a new stored class in frequent access. Again, still gives you 11 nines of durability, significantly lowers the cost while allowing you to retain that data online but for data that you don't access very frequently, and then there's an additional charge if you do have to bring it back. And then, of course, there's Amazon Glacier for very cold data that you need to store for a very, very low cost, three to five hours retrieval time. And S3 will take care of managing this life cycle for you sitting underneath your big data platform. Another feature of S3 is that you can use it to generate events whether that's object lost, object created, and then consume that with AWS services like Lambda, API Gateway, SNS, SQS, and so on, and really allow the data storage system to sit at the heart of your business. So some use cases that we would like you to consider for your big data applications. The first one would be S3 is your primary store for all things data related. S3 is integrated with tools like DynamoDB, Redshift, Lambda, EMR, Data Pipeline, Kinesis, Machine Learning, QuickSight, and really sits at the heart of your data management problem. One of the ways that people will use this as a replacement for an HDFS environment. We've significantly invested in functionality within Elastic MapReduce that allows you to treat S3 in the same way that you would treat HDFS with significantly higher performance than you would get from the native Hadoop implementations of the S3 driver. And for example, we offer you Amazon EMRFS, the Elastic MapReduce file system, which indexes S3 data in DynamoDB to give you about twice the performance you would get from using S3 raw. And that's accompanied with a command line client that allows you to do things like manually syncing your data creating differences between the EMRFS index and so on. And this pattern allows you then to uh, do some very interesting things about you know, using S3 as your primary store and HDFS just for temporary storage between individual jobs that you're running. And this allows you then to shut down clusters when they're no longer running and no longer needed. And this saves you a lot of money while retaining the data with 11 nines of durability. You also don't have to think about scaling of your HDFS environment and how do you provide enough cores and enough RAM to keep up with your throughput requirements because S3 will scale automatically for you. And we have customers who shared uh, evidence of seeing 70, 80% linear scalability, serializing data at two terabytes a minute out of S3. It also allows you to really simply share data between Hadoop clusters in a way that doing it with HDFS is just very complicated to do. And so whether you're uh, creating one cluster that's on a CPU-optimized family, generating some data onto S3, and then consuming that into another tool, you can really mix and match the compute independently of this storage tier. And that allows us to do Another interesting use case, which is just for Hadoop and HDFS backups. You know, Elastic MapReduce has a massive ecosystem of tools that sit around it. And a great example of this is HBase. HBase allows you to create incremental backups 
and S3 is a perfect place to put those. Very long-term durability, very easy to restore those backups out, and uh, quite an obvious uh, solution, really. I found the clicker. The other use case that we're seeing more and more of is being able to treat S3 as a data-centric event bus. What do we mean by that? Well, taking advantage of these events and allowing us to drive your business workflows from the events that are occurring on S3 itself. So a great example that you might consider using is one where you build an EC2 instance to service incoming data feeds with something like SFTP. That EC2 instance can use something like S3FS, the S3 file system, so that those files that are coming in through FTP are never sitting on local instance storage. They're just being sent directly through to S3. And then we can use AWS Lambda to pick up those file events. And we have an example of how you can use AWS Lambda to load that data into Redshift automatically. So this would be a serverless infrastructure for taking FTP input and just loading it into a database. And that's a uh, like really nice idea for how you could create S3 as the heart of the workflow and then build these serverless architectures that sit around it. So I'd like to introduce our first customer speaker. Uh, Redfin is a real estate management company. And uh, we're very pleased to uh, invite them up to talk about how they're using S3 and some of these patterns uh, to go faster and do smarter and more interesting things. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, so before I start, I right, just want to do a general poll. How many of you guys have heard about Redfin? All right, thank you. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard about us, uh, we are a real estate broker. Uh, we started in 2006 uh, in Seattle and uh, starting as a technology company. Now, over the years, we found, hey, we actually need an agent. So now we actually uh, have full-time agents working for us, try to help people buy and sell houses. Um, myself, I actually, uh, I, I manage the big data analytics team. Uh, we have a bunch of data scientists and software engineers building a big data platform. Uh, bigger part uh, for us is trying to answer the questions, some of the questions about uh, what does the user want, right? Uh, who they are and, and what do they need and how can we be helpful for the home buying or selling. Uh, it's a, a very emotional process when you uh, first, home, uh, first time home buying. You know, it's usually it's the largest purchase in your life. You don't do it very often, and uh, you are trying to figure out where is the place you're gonna stay for a long period of time. So we're trying to figure out a way to help our users to um, identify, find, search for the homes, and then once they actually uh, find out the home they like, we have an agent to help through them to go get you into the house and tour the house negotiate and uh, uh, close a deal. Uh, our, uh, our model is, slight, is different, quite different from the traditional brokers. Our agent got paid based on the customer satisfaction. And we don't get paid uh, 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 based on sort of any advertising. We, bas we got paid when we actually close a deal with a customer. And our agent got paid based on the uh, satisfaction. So if you guys come back to say, hey, close the deal with the reference agent Young, I come back and say, hey, Young, it really sucks. You know, I don't want to work with you anymore. I probably get very little bonus. But if you actually give me a very good review, I get a lot more bonus. So that's actually uh, our effort trying to align this incentive of the agent with the customers. So how do we, uh, uh, how do we, uh, it doesn't look, uh, so the fundamental way, uh, our team is trying to figure out, to understand who are the users are, what do they want, and how can we be helpful. And it really is a kind of a matchmaking business we're doing here, right? The way we see real estate at this stage is that you need, you need uh, uh, to know about the users, you need to know about the uh, properties, and also you know when to get the agent engaged to help close the deal. Uh, we have a lot of data about our users 
I didn't look it up too well, but uh, we have millions of users uh, generate billions of events you know, um, every month. And the user also, uh, we have agents, thousands of agents across the country. We have 80 markets in the US uh, that taking the uh, users to see houses, you know, open houses, and close deals. Uh, there's a lot of uh, agent-generated uh, uh, data. For properties, we have imported the data about properties uh, overall, about 100 million U.S. properties. And there's a ton of data about the neighborhood uh, and anything, the, the uh, uh, soil history, uh, a lot of things about the properties. So what we're trying to do is to do the uh, matchmaking uh, work. Uh, for then. You have tons of data, and, but you're trying to generate insight, right? Uh, try to understand what does people really want it. So what we did is build a platform uh, to process all the data. There's a s fundamentally two ways of doing that. One is the batch processing. Another part is the real-time processing. This is kind of like the Lambda uh, architecture. Uh, it's slightly uh, different, but uh, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the batch processing aspect. So start with the raw data. Right? You have data comes in. Uh, we use uh, our entire platform is built on AWS. Um, we have uh, all the raw data in S3, and all the compute uh, we're using EMR EC2, and all the front end uh, we're using DynamoDB, Redshift, or S3. Um, so the overall design it's like what Ian mentioned. We use S3 to store data, to produce the data and the, all the process data. And we use EMR for compute. But we, we have the design that there's, we don't have any persistent EC2 instances. We don't have any of, uh, n none of our EMR clusters is persistent. So we only use it as we, uh, 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 as we need it to. Uh, it's kind of remind uh, the, the one of the principles we, we we're thinking is kind of like a databases. You know, for those of you guys are familiar, there's this asset right principles: atomic, consistent, isolation, and the durable. We're able to do that using S3 to achieve the durability piece. So all the data comes in, we produce it in S3. When we process it, we save it back to S3. Uh, so that's a general pattern, and every single task we do. It has its own environment, starting from the EMR cluster and the bootstrap with the software we, de uh, we deploy on it, process it. Once we finish, we save the data back to S3, then we shut down the cluster. Uh, we use, uh, we use uh, spot instance, uh, 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 EC2 instances. So for those of you who know that spot instance is actually really uh, depends on how the market goes. So your instance could be get killed at any time. Uh, and that's one of the challenges we're facing. You know, we want to go cheap, manage the cost, but at the same time, we want to make sure that uh, um, we get our job done. The way we do that is we, spend, uh, we, we build a spot instance bidding strategy. The idea is actually, I'm going to actually predict how likely a certain instance is going to be cost, certain instance type is going to cost, and bid for that. And uh, if I got the resource, I will run my job on top of it. Uh, if I'm lucky, I'll finish my job, and I, I shut down my cluster. Okay? And if I'm unlucky, and sometimes we are, that in the middle of the job, the EC2 instances are gone, because someone else outbid me, then the cluster will uh, be, be shut down, and the, the task itself will rerun. We're actually going to ditch everything in between, start from scratch. Right? This is how we achieve sort of like a transaction-based uh, 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 idea. So it's a very simple uh, sort of a design, but it also empowered us to build things very, um, um, uh, it's very easy for us to build on top of it. You really don't have to manage any state of your processing. You use S3 as the checkpoint for your output, for your input, and then you use the EMR for compute. So I'll give you one example about uh, how we use this pipeline and what do we do with it. Uh, in general, uh, for, for, for we, we have a couple of different uh, uh, services. One is actually we do some user profiling, you know, understand the users, the scoring, what do they like, or give you a recommendation about the user, what house they like. 
Another part on the property aspect will pre predict how likely a home will be sold. We call that hot homes. Uh, so this is a, one of the features that we released last year. The general idea is actually we give a, hey, any properties on the market at a given price, I'm trying to predict, hey, how likely you'll be sold within X number of days. Uh, this is essentially the, uh, uh, one of the time we're trying to do is give a little bit more insight to the buyers. This is mostly a buyer feature. Say, in a hot market, I think, uh, 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 for example, in the Bay Area or in Seattle, you're going to say, you know, the house come on, on, on top, and you really want to know when should I actually go toward it, and when should I put in the offer. So this will give a little bit of insight about how likely the home is going to be uh, sold. Uh, so how do we do this? I'll give you a little bit of a preview of how, how we do it. And uh, uh, don't try to read through it. It's not <laughs> intended to be read through. Uh, in general, every single dot, a node you see there, is a single task. So for hot homes, this is the whole workflow of the hot home feature. Uh, every single task, starting from the left to right, it's the different tasks that we're processing data. We're either ingesting the raw data, or we're actually building uh, uh, features, extracting features, uh, and then we may build the machine learning models, the hot home models, and all we're actually doing is scoring or publishing the result uh, to the front of DynamoDB. Those are the sort of the overall workflow. Every single node is a single task. That task is independent in a way that can be retried, can be redrive, so the whole thing can be automated. Um, so that's the, the general, all the machine learning features, we have this type of pipeline. For some of the real-time cases, we have a different pipeline. For the batch processing pipeline, basically there's no, not a single EC2 instance are persistent. And uh, everything is persistent on S3. So again, just trying to go through the, the current uh, path, uh, what we have. For the batch processing, we use S3 to staging the data, to save the data. We use EMR for compute, and we use DynamoDB uh, for front end, and we use Redshift for people, uh, the data warehouse use cases. For real-time pipeline, we use SQS. Uh, we use uh, Kinesis to store the, uh, the streams. There's a user stream, there's a property stream, there's an agent stream. And then we build on top of that to, to enable some of the features like A-B testing, real-time personalization, and marketing stuff. So uh, just trying to summarize how we use, you know, how we use the storage for our analytic pipeline. Essentially, EMR, EC2, it's all temporary data. We, we, don't, we don't use it that much. And we use uh, S3 as a permanent primary data store. Uh, SQS Kinesis is the event bus. It's the stream data store. Uh, DynamoDB, we use that as a prime, uh, production caching layer. It's, in essence, it's not a, a all the data being replaced every day, every hour, sometimes by seconds. So we have billions of records on primary, uh, on uh, DynamoDB, um, uh, but it's essentially a caching layer, provide a low latency, high availability layer for us. For Redshift, this is for people. You know, people who are familiar with uh, SQL, uh, uh, SQL, they can just analyst, PM, business user, they can actually query the data directly on Redshift. Um, so how do we use S3? We use that for raw data, staging data, checkpoint, and production. Everything needs to be republishable, redrivable from S3. So that's, that's the fundamental design of what we have. Uh, so why S3? Uh, S3 is very simple and easy for us to use, right? Um, and very scalable. We don't have to worry about scaling. And the bigger part, number one for, for us, is uh, highly durable. Since we, the whole design is built upon that the data is there, when I write to S3, I, I can be you know, assured that there's a very low probability that it will be lost, you know, 11, 9 uh, sort of durability. Um, and another nice thing is really easier for a small team like us, uh, there's a lot of integration built in. You know, I don't have the, uh, the, the connectors with the DynamoDB, with the Redshift, with the Kinesis, uh, there's a lot of things that Amazon attribute uh, around S3, which actually just provide a lot of automation and just free stuff for us to use. So some of the tips and lessons learned. Um, the number one lesson for us and the most important message I want to say is actually I, we use S3 as the trusted primary persistent store. Okay? 
That's the number one uh, thing we learned. Uh, other little things, um, uh, since we're a small team and every engineer is a very, uh, um, uh, they, they do things quick. And uh, uh, by design, we don't really don't have a very rigorous process. So every now and then, we have people to say, oops, young, I delete some of the data. I say, okay, what do we do? Uh, we can redrive it. Uh, if it's just uh, some small amount of data, it's very easy to redrive, but not a big problem. What if you delete like the past three years, two years of data? Yes, in principle, you can redrive those. It's gonna take a long time. It's gonna take us a long time just as a developer to manually run it. So we really don't want to, some of the data, uh, we really don't want to lose it. So we come out of design and say, hey, why don't we do this? Just kick a, take a copy of the, the buckets that we really care about and save it into another bucket. So okay, let's do that. So we did that, and then we look at our bill, say, oops, our S3 cost just doubled. Um, so I guess that's by design. And then later we learn, hey, there's a cross-region replication. <laughs> we really don't have to do the whole thing ourselves, but we did that already. Uh, then there are other parts that say, hey, maybe we, we should try S3 versioning. That turns out to be the one that uh, uh, we're using now. What happened is actually, if there's cases people actually accidentally did something, we can always say, hey, use S3 versioning, pick it up, and then recover from that. Uh, luckily, we haven't done that too often, so I think uh, the team getting a little more mature. Um, another lesson we learned is really how to organize your data with S3. When we started, it was pretty small, right? We just uh, um, kind of random organized the different buckets and then how we named the objects. Um, so the bucket level, really, we, we have some of high level sort of breakdowns. Things like, hey, some of the raw data, we, you know, some of it is actually external party drop off data to us. We have a dedicated bucket for that. For some of the intermediate results, those uh, machine learning sort of the, uh, process data, the models, we want to produce into uh, uh, different buckets. And we break it out the buckets by, uh, uh, by feature. Um, but within uh, so each bucket, the naming convention, because a lot of data we have is partitioned by day. We just do something like, uh, for example, uh, prefixes like hot home slash 2015-09-01. Uh, what we later learned is actually since we actually, that actually works uh, well until we have some tables, some of the hive tables have like 50,000, 100,000 partitions. It takes a long time to load the table and you're gonna see cases that uh, it got time out that you can't even load the table properly. Um, so those are the things that are really hard to change later. So unfortunately, we get stuck with it. We have other ways to solve the problem. Uh, so when you design your bucket and when you name your, your object, figure the way, think, think ahead of time. You know, as it goes, S3, if it had become your primary data store, there will be more data to it. And over time, you're gonna hit on some of the limitations. So uh, talk about those limits. Um, we learned every single limit, I guess we hit on almost. Uh, the single put, there's a file gig limit. Uh, we, we learned that. And the single object have a file, a file terabytes, I think, uh, the limit. Um, there's also 100 buckets that you can have for per account. I believe you can talk to S3 and ask them to increase that limit. That's a kind of soft limit. Um, there's a, a, a couple other uh, limits with uh, uh, EMRFS. For example, uh, you can turn on the consistent view if you don't turn it on, there might be cases that you may see, uh, you know, eventual consistent come in play. It will be say, hey, I write the data there. How do I, why it takes long for me to show, to look at my object? But if you turn on the uh, uh, sort of even, uh, uh, consistent view, you should be able to uh, get the data quickly. Um, another part we learned is actually to set up monitors. Um, since we have uh, built this trust with the S3, we sort of ignored it. And over time, we found, oh, you know, there's a lot of data we put there. And some of the data really, uh, we don't use it ever, but we just save it there. So that incurred a lot of cost. Uh, so what we did is actually build some monitors, and then we actually defined the uh, data retention policy. You can leverage the S3 lifecycle management to glycerize some of the data or delete some of the data that you don't need. That will actually drive your cost down. Um, so that's what I have, and the Redfin, basically, we are uh, uh, 
a technology company. We, we're also a full service broker. So um, use us if you have any questions. If you're interested in learning how we do things in details, uh, go find me or email me. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Really, um, some good uh, lessons learned there, and uh, wanted to follow on from that and talk about some best practices uh, that we would encourage you to use with S3. Uh, and I think we're going to be touching definitely on some of what uh, Jung was talking about. So, um, you know, when you consider storing data in S3, you have to consider that, of course, not all data is going to need the same sort of storage. Uh, format, so unstructured data versus semi-structured data versus fully structured data. And you, know, you should really consider choosing a format that supports uh, and is sympathetic to the type of data that you're storing, rather than having this idea that everything has to be turned into one and only one format. A good example would be if you choose to store um, some structured data in a columnar format, as soon as you just try and use that columnar format for log files, it starts to get very messy. We also recommend that you store a copy of your raw input, whatever that means to you, whenever you receive data from an application or a system. Definitely store a copy of that, because it allows you, as, as, as Jung said, to redrive your processes from source if needed. And ideally, you would never do that. But uh, as you build these workflows, you absolutely could use that initial raw data set for testing new ideas and so on. The data standardization that you would want to put in place are going to be things like common compression. Or for all types of CSV data, you definitely would want to standardize on a storage format for that. And we would encourage you also to consider how your data is going to evolve over time. Some data formats allow you to have evolvable schemas so that you can continue to consume data with a an updated schema definition, even if old data doesn't fit that, that definition, which is very difficult to do with CSV, for example. So for unstructured data, you know, your, your native log files that you're getting from applications, we just encourage you to use a, a standard codec for compressing that. And consider for big data workloads that that should be a streaming codec, like LZO, Snappy, BZIP2. For semi-structured data, JSON, XML, this is an area where you definitely should consider how that data is going to change over time and potentially use a data format that will allow that change to be easily consumed by your big data applications. And of course, lots of structured data is CSV today, and that's how we receive it. But that doesn't mean that's the only way we can store it. So columnar storage formats like ORC and Parquet can give you massive performance gains. But again, we would absolutely expect you keep a CSV copy of that in case you ever wanted to change from one format to another. So where you store that on S3 is very important, as Jung touched on as well. So uh, you know, S3 is a flat key space. It doesn't have the concept of a directory. So if you want to rename the path for a petabyte of data, you're going to have to go through and rename every single file. And that can become very expensive. So thinking about the path structure ahead of time is extremely important. And we'd like you to consider the idea that you know, the natural partitioning of the data, including using things like the application that generated the data, the time, um, business unit, those are all really good things to build into the prefix rather than just having some arbitrary structure. And where we can start to think about uh, the idea of representing S3 using a resource-oriented architecture. This is the idea that on a, a web application, for example, every sort of basic business primitive is exposed through your web API at a path that is self-describing and intuitive. And this is a great principle to apply to your data, because it lets your data then almost have a metadata index or a catalog built into where it's stored. And that will ease integration between systems and so on. So I'd next like to uh, invite our uh, guest from Twitter to join, um, Joseph. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about how they've applied some of these best practices. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, Young, as well. Uh, I actually uh, used Redfin myself when I was looking at houses uh, last month. All right. Uh, my name is Joseph Unruh. Uh, I'm the tech lead for the Telepart group at Twitter. 
Uh, you've probably never heard of Telepart, but you've almost certainly interacted with it. Uh, on most sites that display advertisements, um, we will generally get a notification of that and get a bid request for that advertisement. This means that we get around 200,000 requests per second, and we're adding about 15 to 20 terabytes of data S3 every single day. So I want to uh, share some of our experiences, how we built an architecture around that scale, and uh, how we work with S3 strengths, work around S3's weaknesses, and um, how you can uh, use S3 at a similar scale. All right, so first of all, uh, doesn't Twitter have its own infrastructure? Um, why, why is Twitter on AWS? So just five short months ago, uh, Telepart was a completely independent company. Uh, we built our entire infrastructure on top of AWS and S3. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, since the acquisition, we have, continued, we have grown on Twitter's infrastructure, but we have also continued to grow on top of AWS. And we're just one piece of uh, Twitter's uh, AWS usage. Um, we run two to 3,000 machines at any given time, and we're just a part of uh, Twitter's overall presence. And uh, generally, uh, acquisitions that come into Twitter are on AWS. So the better that Twitter supports this, uh, uh, the AWS use case, the better uh, it can integrate new companies into the fold. All right, so Twitter uh, generally experiences 316 million monthly active users on their website. But that's dwarfed by the number of unique visitors overall who aren't logged into the site. And uh, even more people see the little Twitter widgets uh, that appear inside of sites, um, uh, nearly 200 billion in every single quarter. So what Telepart does is we help drive knowledge and information about those logged out users, as well as serving uh, the uh, offsite advertising uh, for Twitter as a whole. We have a lot of expertise in building up uh, cross-device and cross-platform user understanding so that we can identify a single user um, regardless of where they're signing in from. Uh, so, first off, uh, if anybody's had the experience of browsing on a merchant website and then um, browsing around the internet later and seeing those products that you've seen over and over again, uh, I do want to apologize. Um, but we want to make this experience better. We actually believe that advertising should be an experience that people want to see <clears throat> because it's providing useful recommendations and useful information. But this demonstrates what a hard problem it is. And um, we solve it by making sure that we uh, have the full user identity information. Uh, we can load the entire history of the user. Uh, we load profile attributes, such as um, gender, uh, number of times they've bought things, um, and even uh, when they've uh, returned things uh, to the store after purchasing them online. We feed all that information into our bidding models and uh, determine how much to bid. And this has to happen in under 100 milliseconds, or else um, uh, we eclipse the, uh, the data timeline for the networks. Um, and this is happening up to 200,000 times every second. So we've chosen to use a Lambda-style architecture uh, to deal with this. Um, in, in our case, uh, data is fed from the front end, both to our speed layer and our batch layer. Uh, on the back end, we are uh, setting up the user graphs um, uh, with Hadoop and setting up user history. And we feed all of that into uh, Horcrux, which is our internal read-only database. And we use a read-only database, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Uh, we use a read-only database because our response time requires that <coughs> uh, the Horcrux lookups happen in a single contiguous disk read. And that's really only possible with a read-only data store. Uh, in order to make sure that our data stays fresh, we also route that data through Kafka and Spark, where we build naive identity linkages and incremental user history, and put that into uh, SpeedyB, uh, another in-house database that's based off Redis, which keeps all of that more recent data in memory. So between the two of them, we get really fast access, and at the front end, the data gets merged together. All right. So I want to talk mostly about the batch architecture. That's where S3 lives, and it's uh, incidentally where I have the most expertise. All right, so on the batch side, uh, our first step is we clean up our data. That means filling in our missing fields, 
that means uh, pre-joining on all of the data sources that are commonly used together, and uh, uh, that means organizing the data in appropriate partitions uh, by, by hour, uh, including dealing with late data as it comes in. <coughs> uh, next, we uh, build our overall identity graph. And then we build our S3, uh, sorry, then we build our uh, machine learning models and um, other recommendation models. Um, so all of this is happening on thousands of machines uh, over hundreds of jobs. Uh, we write out 15 to 20 terabytes of new data every single day, and we're reading about 100 to 150 terabytes of data from uh, S3 every day. All right. Uh, Batch architecture, um, so we operate in both the uh, US East 1 and US West 1 region for now. Uh, in both cases, the front ends read in data, write out, describe, and publish that data into S3. We use uh, Hadoop to build up our base data sources. We use Hadoop plus 8Space uh, in order to build up our identity graphs, and we use Spark to build our machine learning models. Uh, all that data ends up in S3 and is published out to uh, Horcrux in both regions. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about how we use S3 and leverage its strengths and work around some of the weaknesses. Um, it's worth saying that uh, S3 is our most widely used service outside of Amazon EC2, um, and it is our persistent data store. Uh, the only other persistent data store we have of any significance is our uh, MySQL clusters and, um, and a couple of RDS instances. Uh, I've already talked about uh, Hadoop and Spark, um, but I also want to uh, add that we use uh, Hive and Spark SQL uh, with, with those as well. Um, for, we also store our Docker containers on top of S3. Uh, and we use our Docker containers within our Apache Aurora deployments. Uh, Apache Aurora is a Mesos framework that allows users to uh, schedule jobs and set up services uh, on a common resource pool with arbitrary instances inside of it. <coughs> by, uh, by treating things as resources, uh, such as CPU, disk, and memory, uh, it abstracts the way the instance types uh, it's actually very similar to um, uh, EC2 Container Store. Uh, I've talked about Horcrux a little bit already. We also use S3 to store our uh, machine learning models, uh, which gets populated into our custom green room database. Uh, finally, we use uh, SFTP for storing all of our client data. And by putting that on S3, uh, it means we're essentially unconstrained in our space. Uh, oftentimes, we've served as an unofficial backup for our clients. Uh, when they've lost data, and we can make it available to them again. Like Redfin uh, and others, we run our batch uh, uh, infrastructure almost entirely from Spot. And thus, actually, most of our infrastructure is run on Spot. Um, this keeps our costs extra low, but um, price spikes mean that we can lose a single machine or even an entire cluster in a very short amount of time. And this requires an unusual resilience to errors. Um, and this is why our S3 is really important for us, because it is our, truly, our only truly persistent data source. Um, we've started uh, to migrate to Spotfleet, uh, which is uh, Amazon's new um, sort of general framework for uh, bringing, up, uh, bringing up Spot instances. Um, and uh, our, our initial tests show that we're going to be able to get much better price stability and overall system stability from using it because we can start out with a mix of instance types. Um, sometimes each, uh, S3 just isn't fast enough. Um, there's two main use cases that drive our, uh, our, um, our caching of the underlying data. Um, the first is um, our querying users, uh, like our analysts and um, people who want to debug underlying issues. Uh, when people are querying the data, they expect fast responsive times. Otherwise, they're sitting around waiting for their query to result uh, to complete, and they're being unproductive. We should be able to explore our data quickly so we can extract new information. The other major use case is that um, Amazon S3 uh, partitions all of its data based on the key name. What this often means is that uh, a single date partition for us 
gets mapped onto a single um, uh, S3 key space for them because it's all within a single date folder. If you have many jobs reading from that same data source, uh, uh, it's overloading that single partition on S3 and uh, resulting in slowdown in data for each of the jobs. By keeping a cache on HDFS, it ensures that uh, that data is readily accessible. Uh, the other layer of cache that we have is Tachyon. Currently, we're running with about seven terabytes of in-memory. Uh, Tachyon is uh, another HDFS replacement layer. Um, and we found that by running Spark SQL on top of Tachyon, uh, we can have query times that go from a couple minutes down to a couple of seconds. So data caching is hard. Um, so we have a system that we've developed to manage that process. Uh, jobs no longer have to be aware of the paths they're reading and writing from. Instead, they just specify the name of the path that they're reading and writing from, along with the partitions that they're interested in. And the Metastore will tell them where to get it from and where to write it to. Uh, jobs always write to S3 so that we can ensure that it's persistent and sticks around. And then the Metastore allows the job once it's complete, it will set off caching to the appropriate layers if necessary. And once that caching is done, it will make that uh, data available to other jobs as inputs. Uh, the other thing that the Metastore does for us is it keeps a full index of S3 paths. Um, doing list operations on S3 is very slow uh, to the point where um, uh, if SQL queries uh, end up touching S3, it can add as much as a third to the uh, additional runtime by listing paths. This makes it nearly instantaneous. Uh, in addition, it updates the Hive Metastore uh, so that Spark and uh, Spark SQL and Hive uh, always have up-to-date information. Uh, finally, we make a lot of use of the uh, S3 bucket policies and EC2 roles. Um, when we were acquired about five months ago, uh, or when the acquisition was announced uh, about five months ago, we found out at the same time as everybody else. And we had 30 days in which to make sure that we were regular, regulatory compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley uh, in order for Twitter to be able to recognize our revenue. So this means that uh, no data uh, which has uh, revenue or financial information can be deleted, and we applied this generally to our important data sources. Uh, so by using bucket policies and EC2 roles, we are able to lock it down so certain data could only be written by one cluster and then lock down that cluster so only code that had been code reviewed could be run on top of it. Um, but even if you don't uh, use, uh, have uh, regulatory requirements for your data, uh, I definitely recommend using bucket policies to help control your data. Uh, once early on uh, in Teleparts history, just before I joined, a developer uh, wrote a script which accidentally started deleting all of their base data sources. Um, fortunately, we followed some of Ian's advice and had some backups. Uh, we were able to restore it and uh, recover some of the deleted data. But after that, we implemented policies to prevent deletion unless explicitly stated. All right, so I want to tell you about how you can achieve this kind of performance uh, on S3 yourself. Um, choosing an instance type uh, can be a delicate balance. <clears throat> Oftentimes it's better to have a larger instance type because it keeps the data local and it, has, it means to have a smaller cluster to manage. Uh, however, uh, because of uh, EC2 bandwidth limits, um, we've discovered that it's often advantageous to have smaller rather than larger instance types. Uh, so I ran a test with uh, four R32X larges and one R38X larges which uh, in theory are uh, equivalent in terms of total resources. And uh, the four R32X larges had 50% better uh, bandwidth than uh, a single R38X large. Uh, however, the benefit didn't extend uh, to R3 larges for us um, because at that point, the S3 transfer was no longer the bottleneck and the bottleneck was actually the inter-machine communication. Um, when reading and writing from S3, always use multi-part uploads and downloads. Um, this means that you can start uploading <clears throat> as the processing completes. It also means that you can start downloading, start processing things as you're downloading. It also means in either case that if there's a failure, you can deal with it and just re-upload that one part. Uh, when you're using Hadoop and Spark, use the newer S3A library instead of the older S3N library. 
uh, uses Java's S3 library underneath instead of the Jet S3T. Um, and we found S3A is far more performant and has better error recovery. And again, um, try to avoid list operations on S3. Uh, we aren't on EMR um, because it uh, would add significantly to the underlying spot price that we have. Um, however, if you are on EM, EMR, there's uh, EMRFS, which Ian talked about, uh, which is a great operation, or great option for dealing with uh, uh, the slow list operations issue. Uh, when running MapReduce on S3, uh, we recommend that you disable speculative execution for reducers and write the output directly. Um, for those that don't know, speculative execution uh, takes free resources on a cluster and runs duplicates of existing uh, of tasks that are already running. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this requires that it output to a temporary location and then move that data to the final destination when it's done. Uh, because of eventual consistency, sometimes when it tries to move that file, it isn't present and the overall process fails. Uh, that being said, um, uh, about two months ago, uh, S3 introduced uh, read after write consistency on the S3 standard region. Uh, so it's actually possible that this underlying problem is fixed and we haven't had a chance to test it yet. Um, file sizes should be equal to or slightly less than HDFS block size. Um, I know HDFS block size is a totally arbitrary uh, uh, sort of restriction on S3 since they don't mean anything. However, both Spark and Hadoop use the block size as a guide for how to distribute data to mappers and reducers. Uh, so if you can keep your file size uh, equal and approximate to the block size, then you're gonna have a much more consistent uh, experience reading data. Um, we use uh, the Parquet column-based file format. Uh, we recommend it, but generally we recommend it for only base data sources and not necessarily everything. There's a little extra overhead in creating it, um, but if it gets read frequently, it's, uh, Definitely worth it. All right. So uh, in the course of building our overall architecture, we've had many late nights uh, in which things went wrong. And we want to share some of the lessons uh, that we've learned in the course of building it. Um, always learn as much as you can about AWS services before you use them. Uh, it helps you to understand what's happening underneath. Um, it allows you to write more performance, uh, more performance systems for it. Uh, it also means you have a better understanding of what's going wrong when you get that 2 a.m. page and uh, are better able to deal with emergencies. Uh, try to use Amazon libraries as much as possible. Pretty much across the board, we've found that they're more performant and uh, have uh, better error handling, uh, mostly because they have a better understanding of the underlying implementations and are kept better up to date. And then finally, always be ready for machines to fail. Um, we run uh, 2,000 machines in batch every night, and it's guaranteed that every day one of them is going to have some sort of issue, either networking, performance, or bad neighbor. Uh, rather than spending time debugging issues, just be ready to kill machines as soon as there's anything wrong with them and let Amazon bring up new ones. Uh, it's definitely much more expedient. All right, uh, we are hiring. Uh, so if you go to the uh, Twitter careers page under software engineering, and search for Telepart, uh, we're definitely interested. Oh, I think you're up. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you. So yeah, just a quick wrap up. You know, you know, I think we've heard some great stories about how S3 can really give you this uh, fantastic approach to having a very high durability, high performance centralized store uh, which will allow you to syndicate into other big data environments. Um, you know, there's a lot of interfaces, a lot of tools, uh, and we'll continue to build services that are able to consume data from S3, push data back. Um, and you know, definitely please consider uh, you know, your storage approach, the prefixes that you're using so that you don't uh, create something that isn't going to meet your needs long term. That's about the only thing that you need to kind of consider up front. Um, and with that, we're, we're out of time. Uh, we're happy to take questions. Um, after, uh, maybe at the back, so the room can be freed up. Um, but thank you again to Redfin and Twitter for uh, their time and attention, and thank you very much. <laughs>